What is up, everybody? Welcome to Comic Book Club. I'm Alex. I'm Pete. And we're coming to you live from a couple of places on the internet. We are live on Facebook. We're live on YouTube. We're live on Twitch. We're live on X, also known as Twitter. Maybe you're listening later on Spotify or Android or Apple or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It's all good. Uh, unfortunately, what is not good, or is fine, I guess, is Justin, our third co-host, is not here. He is off celebrating an early Thanksgiving with his family. They like to hunt the turkey on a Tuesday and then brine it on a Wednesday. I ran out of steam there very quickly. Yeah, you really gave up uh, on that old story. <laughs> I sure did. Um, well, anyway, he's not going to be here, but that doesn't matter because we have some amazing guests for you tonight first one we're going to bring in she is the creator behind the new darkling comic that is coming out this week from archie comics ladies and gentlemen sarah Cahoon. hello sarah hey, hey. welcome hi oh my gosh so excited to have you here so excited to talk about this book um without getting into spoilers too much we read it i don't want to speak for pete i loved it Thank you. yeah um, i thought this was just a great supernatural i don't want to call it a teen uh, but ya i guess uh pitch it almost felt like in the first issue like mm -hmm. it's sort of this very much done in one tale but one of the things that i loved about it is it's exactly the sort of first issue that really makes you want to read more um could you talk a little bit about i think this was bringing this character back from the old archie comics character what you had to keep what you wanted to take away etc I'll stop monologuing that. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, you know, it was kind of a modern reimagining of the character. She hadn't been in the spotlight for a while. There were a few little shorts she was in with the Archie gang, uh, I believe, that came out last year. Um, so that was fun. But um, yes, uh, basically, the Archie Comics editor, Jamie Rotante, uh, she's amazing. She approached me and she said they wanted to do something with this character, uh, perhaps in college um, or it could be back in high school, but just something in that space where she was kind of getting a chance to to shine and um, maybe um, explore her magic a little bit. And I guess the main thing with Darkling, so she is uh, in, in our version, she is a college student named Darla Lang. She is going to a very um, creepy atmospheric uh, university, Ivy Hollow University. And um, she has this cape, which is something that we we took from the original Darkling. She has a cape that is basically, um, it's kind of like a melee weapon. She can uh, wrap people or things up in it and then transport them somewhere else. Um, so it comes in very handy during all sorts of uh, supernatural battles, I guess. But uh, she kind of sees it as a curse. It's sort of what has set her apart, what has made her alone, what has sort of made her weird and different. And so she has actually come to Ivy Hollow University because she is trying to get rid of it. And she has heard that this very creepy college has kind of a special connection to the supernatural world. So she's hoping she can figure out how to rid herself of the cape once and for all. Um, and I guess, spoiler alert, that's not what ends up happening. Um, <laughs> but it is, it is a story about kind of, you know, embracing the power that is within you, um, learning that what sets you apart is actually really cool. Um, and, you know, me and uh, the amazing artist, Carola Barella, you can see her, her name up there on the character designs. Um, we kind of work together to bring this version of Darkling to life. Well, awesome. I wanted to ask you about that a little bit, because for anybody listening in the audio podcast, there's a very big difference between the classic look of Darkling, which very much leans into like the 70s, 80s, maybe, maybe earlier than that style of superheroes. You got the belly button window, you got the tight suit fitting superhero costume. This is very different. This is a much mm -hmm. more modern interpretation. Mm -hmm. So right. what led from one thing to another? And what, if anything, do you think is the connection there? 
I mean, I think that, um, you know, she still, I would say, looks very similar when she does her Darkling transformation, <laughs> which she does, I think, only one time near the end of the book. But it's really cool. Corella drew it in an amazing, like, really just, like, magical way. There's, like, sparkles on the pages. It's really nice. Um, but for this one, you know, since we were kind of reimagining the character, um, we sort of talked about what this version of Darkling would, would look like, what would make sense for her being in context as a college student, because for most of the book, you know, she is a quote unquote regular college student. She sort of um, is, you know, more in that, I guess, context than in a superhero context or even, you know, with the Archie gang. And so I think I remember um, when Corolla started working on the character designs, I think Jamie, the editor, asked me, like, well, what do you, um, I, you know, she knows that I like, I like fashion. She's like, well, what do you, what do you think is like Darla's style? Like, what does she look like before she transforms? And I think what I said was something like, um, it's like a cross between the original craft, the movie, the craft, um, mm -hmm. back in, uh, I think that was nineties, early aughts, like somewhere in there. And um, all of those like amazing gothic thriller romance covers where there's like this trope of like a beautiful woman in like a flowing dress running away from a castle or a mansion. Mm -hmm. um, there are like entire uh, websites dedicated to <laughs> this visual um, that was very big back in the days. So I was like, I kind of wanted to look like a, a like a cross between those two things. And I felt like Corolla like immediately got that and she really knocked it out of the park. Like all of the outfits are amazing. Um, we incorporated the cape and, you know, some people have asked me like, well, how did you explain the Kate? Because she's supposed to be sort of living in this mundane world. And first of all, like, because Darla is kind of an outcast at her school, I was like, well, it's just, you know, part of what people are making fun of, like part of what people, like part of the reason people see her as weird is because she's always wearing this cape. But also I feel like um, having been a college student myself um, a long time ago, uh, I feel like uh, there is like people wear a lot of things on college. Campus. Oh yeah. He wouldn't make mm -hmm. sense to the outside world. I, I had a friend who um, one semester, she was an art student. She wore uh, bunny ears the whole semester oh, as part of, fun. Like, an art installation. And it was just kind of normal. It wasn't anything that anyone really questioned. So I guess I felt like probably a cape wouldn't actually be that weird. Yeah, I, I agree. I, uh, there was this, kid I went to school with and sometimes he dressed as Clark Kent and sometimes yeah. he dressed as full on <laughs> Superman and you had to dress him as such depending on the day. But yeah, I, I really love this. I also really like because Archie has been killing it lately with the Sabrina tie-in, the Riverdale tie-in. And what I really liked about this is it really felt like it fit into that world that I've loved already so nicely. Uh, I also really love her voice. Did, mm -hmm. Were you just channeling college you or uh, <laughs> is this kind of like a, kind of a nice way to vent about college or how did you kind of come up with her voice? I, I really like it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, um, I think that I am perhaps what is known as a voicey writer. So <laughs> that, that, that has been, that term has been used to describe me before. So I think like character voice is just something I really love. Um, okay. Certainly I have gone through, you know, kind of goth isolationist periods in high school and college. So probably there was some of that, but also it felt there were, earnest. It did. If I, yeah, I felt I mean, it, it was great. <laughs> there's, I mean, also I will say like, there was some inspiration from some past versions of Darla and Darkling. Like um, I think in another interview I referenced, there was a, a short that I think came out, I believe last year where it was actually uh, Darla teaming up with Sabrina, which was really fun because mm -hmm. they have such different approaches to magic and being witches and kind of like how they do things. And um, so one of the things I loved about that short is the very opening is Sabrina is texting Darla and she, they haven't met in person before, but she's just like, hi, I'm Sabrina. Um, you know, I got your number from Archie. Like I'm having this problem. Like it's these like walls of text that she's like sending Darla and Darla just texts back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> could you, I, I mean, you touched on this a little bit, but could you talk about the college setting a little bit? The thing that I think is, 
interesting to me, at least, about setting things at college, and I talk about this a lot on too many of our podcasts, but high school is such a palpable time with such big feelings and big iconic moments. College isn't necessarily that way. I feel like it's a it's a bigger lift. It's a harder lift dramatically. Um, what do you think about that and what drew you to that as the setting for this book? Um, I always love writing about college and particularly haunted colleges. Um, mm -hmm. I, I write a, a book series called Heroin Complex. It's about Asian American superheroines in San Francisco. It's a prose novel series. And I wrote one called Haunted Heroin, which was actually set at a haunted college that was sort of inspired by my own haunted college because oh. the college I went to had many famous ghosts, many famous hauntings um, at night, just kind of a, that sort of creepy vibe. So I love that. And, you know, I think for me, um, certainly I had the big, huge emotions you're talking about in high school, but I feel like college was kind of where I had maybe a second coming of age. You know, it's, I, it was the first time I was living away from home. It was the first time I was like, you know, meeting a lot of people that had my same interests that I, you know, could just talk for hours about these weird sort of like very detailed topics that you get into uh, when you're in that setting. And um, so I think like for me, college was such a like a special time, like such a sort of formative time for me that it always feels like something that I like to revisit. And for this, I just thought there was something interesting about you know, someone who has already gone through a few of the big milestones, has gone through childhood and high school and graduating high school and moving away from home and kind of like finding yourself in this new place. And I thought that was just a really interesting place to start her because she has this kind of, a, I don't know, jaded, like seen it all attitude uh, that I thought made sense for that setting. And then of course it was fun to like, just to have like an atmosphere that was this sort of like dark academia, like all the buildings are really like tall and detailed and have this Gothic architecture and lots of creepy windows and like spires and oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> no worries. If you need was, to take that, that's that was, fine. No, that was, a, I guess that was a good one of the ghosts calling me. Ooh. No one ever calls me. So I don't know what that could be. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, it was just like a fun, a sort of fun place to, to set this kind of story. And I also loved the idea of Corolla getting to draw and design this like incredibly like creepy detailed atmospheric campus and again I thought she just knocked it out of the park like I wanted to sort of live in in every page I just thought it looked so haunted <laughs> and so oh, cool wow. so um yeah that was sort of like how we got to that well that's awesome that has to be such a cool feeling when you get that back and and uh, see how great it is what in case anybody at home is wondering what was the college that you went to that was so creepy was that <laughs> it haunted was, you uh it's <laughs> mills college um in oakland california and Ooh, it's not oakland, always no. haunted it's just that it has it has a lot of old buildings it has a lot of ghosts it has sort of a lot of famous ghost stories cool. um when i was going there there was also um, this mystery about um, this this sort of dark figure that we called the Whisperer because they would call like late at night, they would call different dorm rooms and they would whisper, they would be waking you up. So you would sort of be disoriented and they would whisper uh -huh. these things that made you think they were they were someone you knew. And the, the creepiest like story from that is um, there was someone who got a call from, I think it was her brother. And then the next day she found out her brother had passed. Oh away. my God. It was, like, oh, like, it, was so, it was so creepy. And I remember I got one of those calls once and I, you know, I don't think that mystery was ever solved. So the, the oh. whisperer might still be, you know, haunting, on the loose haunting college. Oh my students God. In the oh, Bay man. Area. Uh, well, we got a question here from YouTube for you. This is from Quarter Kick. Is this a one shot? And if so, is it setting up more to come from Mrs. Khan on the character in the future? Let's hope so. Um, yes, it is a one shot. Um, so it was also like for me, it's always kind of a challenge to fit um, all that story in 20 pages. I've done 
more like graphic novels and things like that that were longer stories where we had a lot of room to kind of do a lot of things so i was really happy with what we managed to accomplish in 20 pages i loved working with coral i just thought um her art was so incredible so yeah, expressive really so perfect for this character um and so we'll see you know i think they put at the end there's like one of those like the end for now um, <laughs> question mark <laughs> So we'll see what happens. You know, I guess like buy the book if you really want to see. Yeah. More. Um, but you we, you know, more. I, I think we tried to leave um, Darla in a place where, OK, perhaps there is more uh, to explore with her and the one new friend she's made because she finally lets herself actually make a friend. Um, so who knows? You know, Ivy Hall University, there's still a lot of mystery going on. Um, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Awesome. Well, I really do hope there is more of it yeah. because I really, really love this yeah. first issue. It was so much fun, like I said. Yeah. Um, before we let you go, is there anything else you want to plug? Anything else that folks should be checking out? Oh, um, <laughs> great question. Well, this year um, I did uh, participate in a couple of other um, comics and licensed fiction kind of projects. Um, my uh, And then my, my original like novel series that I mentioned is called Heroin Complex. It's again, Asian American superheroes in San Francisco. It is complete at six books. You can find it wherever books are sold. Um, and then uh, this year I also did um, a graphic novel for DC Comics Young Readers line called it's a really long title that i always mess up girl taking over a lois lane story it is a reimagining of lois lane as an asian american teenager oh, cool. doing her first internship and the artist on that was ariel jovalanis who is amazing we had a wonderful time working together um and then i had um a couple months ago a short prose story in a star wars anthology called from a certain point of view they've done these mm -hmm. for um uh, so far, just the the original trilogy, but hopefully they'll do them for you know all the movies. But it's basically uh, short stories from the the POV of like very kind of ba mostly background supporting characters that you know you might not know what they were thinking during the movie, but now you do. And oh, wow. uh, my story in that um, was something I I actually was very excited about. Um, it's about the dead Ewok. Um, and oh. <laughs> Return of the Jedi oh, oh, oh. in the Battle of Endor, where this yeah. Ewok like dies and his friend tries to wake him up. Oh, yeah, and, it rolls him over. Oh, yeah, my it God, goes yeah. on so long. I feel it like does. this scene like traumatized several generations of Star yeah. Wars, movies, um, including me. So um, I got to kind of give him a nice little memorial in that story. Thank and, you. Um, <laughs> Thank you for doing it. And you that. find out if you save my childhood. He's a real asshole and deserved to die. <laughs> no, hey, right? come on. No, no, don't spoil no. it. It's, it's, very, it's actually, very, I tried to make it honestly as sad as I could because I felt like this Ewok, he never really got a memorial on screen. So we gave him mm -hmm. one. Nice. on the page and yes it did it did heal a little bit of my childhood trauma so those are things i've done recently oh, awesome. um yeah wait quick question the lois mm -hmm. lane graphic novel did mm -hmm. that have anything to do with my adventures with superman or is it just um, no they were actually developed uh kind of you know completely separate huh. but then now that we've both like people behind that and people behind the book have have seen both of those it seems like we had some you know bit points of connection mm -hmm. like yeah, the, lined up. the mind meld like yeah. um, which is very cool um i think they are very lovely companion pieces that are kind of in you know could be seen as sort of in conversation with each other um always love to see new takes on lois um and superman although superman is actually not in our book sorry um yeah. but there is Don't there, need is a, there is a love interest in our book for lois who does Kind of. Well, let's just say she has a type. <laughs> okay. All right. Awesome. Sarah, thank you so much for coming. Yeah. On. Absolute pleasure. Uh, and good luck. Fingers crossed for more Darkling. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. There we go. Uh, once again, oh, check man. out Darkling, which is out as we're taping this from Archie Comics tomorrow. Yeah. You can pick it up in stores and it is very fun. Why don't we bring in our second guest here? He is the writer behind E Junkie which is out now from Scout Comics, ladies and gentlemen, Nicholas Tana. Nicholas, hey, hey, what's up? You are muted. There you go. Hi, how are you hey, doing? Hey, what's going on? 
Uh, yeah. Welcome. I love the I love the, the background background. effect and the hat. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is, uh, you're you're awesome. swagged out, man. Yeah, <laughs> here. You're swagged out. Uh, so this book is pretty wild. I know it's been out for a while at this point, um, but I, I read through this and per the title, it's very much about our addiction to electronics. He said on his weekly live internet talk show, uh, <laughs> what drew you to this subject in particular, just to start with? What drew me to the subject? Well, yeah. um, I was a biotech consultant for years too. So Ooh. I've also seen, um, been privy to a lot of what, um, what's really out there, you know, in terms of the technology and the things that are impacting our culture and our attempts to solve problems. And uh, often the solutions bring new problems. And so uh, the premise of the story that coupled with uh, I've been very engaged ever since the pandemic. I, I have a, a really profound meditation practice and it's um, it's a bit Buddhist. You know, it comes from Buddhist principles and the the Buddhist ideas of suffering and and it's our only salvation, so to speak. You know, it's the way in which we we have to master suffering because life is full filled with it. Let's be real. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and the idea is that there's there's really no pleasure, but more of a reduction of pain. And that amalgamation with our attempts to do whatever we can with technology to solve and, you know, the problem of suffering in life and to make ourselves happier. It seems like there's this cycle and we're constantly being pummeled with new and new technology and new solutions, which create new problems. And so I thought that would make a great premise for a sci-fi story. And that's what started eJunkie. Wow. Uh, well, awesome. we've got at least one review here. Michael Williams on Facebook says E Junkie is phenomenal. So yeah, you got it. You did it. You got a fan. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's talk. So that was the genesis of the idea. But in terms of the actual story, there's a lot going on here. But it has, at least at the beginning, a little bit of the framework of a detective story, I would say. Is that sort of what you started with before blowing it out even bigger? Yeah, I mean, it's I essentially bill it as a sci-fi noir with horror mm -hmm. elements, right? Um, and I play and tease with those genres, but uh, much like Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, you know, or um, that there's it's sort of the detective story uh, built into this, and and the detective is a former alternative reality investigator. He's Whoa. part of the Eris Alternative Reality Investigation Squad. Um, in a world in which you can experience other people's experiences through cellular memory swapping there's some regulation that comes with that i mean there's there's if you can think about it um it would be possible to experience what it was like to to someone who committed suicide or, or someone who died and that can become investigative memories um so but that could also be sold on the black market and so um there's these groups of people are they're they're tasked with trying to regulate that and um so the that that person is Hector Holmes in tribute to you know Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> um, and uh, Hector's job is to try to trace down this group called the Guardians of Pain, who have curated the most painful experiences in human history through cellular memory scraping of corpses. And they're selling it on the black market as this drug known as torch. And it's starting a revolution because we're in a society that has regulated away most pain and suffering through emotional regulation technology. And so now, this group is bringing out this history of horrific human experiences that have been long forgotten. Um, and uh, that's sort of the gist of the story right there. Uh, yeah. Well, I got to say, this was really amazing uh, to read and kind of uh, to kind of get into. I, I, I know we're not talking to the artist, but man, the the whole look of it, especially like the way the neon pops, the, the whole vibe of it. The tone is just so unique and cool. Like, talk to me a little bit about like how you guys created this. Like, how did you talk to him about it? Were you just like, I want the coolest looking future we've ever seen? And the artist was like, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle Fanridge, yeah, he's very talented. Um, that the idea was I wanted sort of Geiger meets Paul Pope. You know, I wanted wow, this, you killed yeah, that heavy liquid neon, you know, color punk. Yes kind of vibe mixed with this gritty realism, you know, with a techno organic techno kind of vibe. Um, and that's exactly what I think he was able to achieve, yeah. um, which creates a, a unique vision to kind of fit with a, a very sorted different tone. 
Uh, you mentioned earlier, I'm forgetting your exact title, but obviously like you're talking about here, you know a little something about biotech. Um, how, <laughs> this is a crazy question to ask. How much of this is real? Like, <laughs> uh, or how much of this is something that potentially in the foreseeable future is the sort of thing we could head towards scientifically? I mean, how screwed are we? I, yeah. I would say significantly 60% mm. to 70% is real based on real things that are happening. Oof. Actually, MIT is doing things right now with emotional AI um, that can sort of register, uh, you know, and, and ma maintain our emotional state um, to be able to have apparel that can react off of um, like heart rate and emotional feelings or, or um, sweat, things like that, that can kind of track and see when someone's nervous and express that with like, like the mood rings of the eighties, you know, 1980s <laughs> um, on our clothes and apparel. I think that's really realistic to be able to have projection apparel or ad apparel, which is also privy that part of this world. Um, and to receive bits based on eyeball tracking to your apparel on your clothes. I think that's a very realistic thing that we'll see in the future, especially in a stipend economy. And so when I create a science fiction world, I really try to think out the economy of the world based on where we're going, based on the technology that's being used, based on our addictions to new experiences. And that's mm -hmm. hence the term e-junkie stands for experience junkie. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, you know, I wanted to create something that there are elements of it that we might have seen in other science fiction, but there's definitely the germ of the idea that there may be a value to pain and suffering is antithesis to almost everything we do in our society. Um, and so I think, I think that element and even the cosmic spiritual that can be derived from that kind of concepting is something we don't see that much in our modern society anymore. It's like, there's this like real split between what is spiritual and cosmic and what is science fiction or science even. And I don't think we see that much. So I dug, dug deep with this thing. I don't think it's your, your, your typical superhero no. kind of fanfare. It is um, awesome, man. And, and I do think if you read the inter chapters and some of the depth and breadth of, there was a chapter that predicts the fall of Hollywood, which was really timely. It starts with the union strikes and what we've recently experienced. Um, I think that's, that says a lot. Um, it landed me a LA times quote after a sci-fi panel at the, uh, <laughs> oh, cool. So that's pretty convenient. <laughs> How at all has this changed your relationship with electronic media doing this book? Has it, has it affected it at all? Well, no, because I think the ideas behind it I, were really in my head and how I approached mm -hmm. technology from the beginning. I think if anything, it's my exploration of where I see it going and maybe a little bit of a manifesto warning for those reading it um, to, to be mindful of where, you know, how far do we go? I'm not saying it's not anti-tech by any means. There are no real heroes and villains. If you read the story, um, there are people with really good intentions um, on all sides of the fence. And then what winds up happening is, you know, there's fallout from everything we create. We create other problems, like I was saying. And so I think, I think it's interesting to get in the minds of that and to see it that way. Um, and so for me, it's more, did it change me? Well, um, you know, I think every time you create something, you dive deeper, it does change you on some level. Um, mm -hmm. but if anything, I think this is, uh, sort of my way of putting it on paper so that everyone can kind of think about their choices when they decide to buy something or use something or how it impacts their lives. Yeah. Uh, other than the LA Times quote, since this book has been out for a while, what has the reaction been like? Have you been able to interact with fans at all? Actually, it only released mid September 18th or 19th. So it hasn't okay. been out too long, um, mm -hmm. only a few months. Um, and, but I think we've been promoting it for quite a while. I think what has come out sooner, which in March, the, the comic book came out. So that was something oh, yeah. that was released. The graphic novel only released, um, I think it was like September 19th or something. And then I don't think people even got it in stores for a couple of weeks after that. But, um, what was the question again? I'm sorry. What was the how, what was the reaction? Is that what you were asking? Yeah, yeah. How are people? Yeah. Have you been able to talk to anybody? 
Yeah, I mean, I think in general, the reaction has been great. I've done a couple of library appearances. I've done some bookstore appearances. I sold out. We sold out practically at, at most of the cons that we brought the book to. Like, I know the Portland, um, the Rose City Comic Con, we, we sold almost awesome. you know, like two two or three copies. Um, so, so the reaction has been really good. People have been, the reviews have been really good and positive for the most part. So um, right. I'm really excited. I think people get into it and they don't realize what they're getting into, you know, yeah, um, yeah. and that's, and that's exciting to be able to put something out there like that. I mean, speaking of getting into it, is this a world that you want to revisit now that the graphic novel is out or have you said, would you want to say in the sci-fi world? Uh, um, Sorry, are you hearing that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. That was the tone. That was the I asked a really good question. Uh, yeah, that was that. Yeah, yeah. And yes, uh, I have a lot more in the world. In fact, I um, I have some, another whole equal amount written um, already mm. that I'd like oh, wow. to share with the world. This is cool. sort of a prequel to a much bigger universe. Um, and even in this world, like there's one particular character who's a clone who serves the dream celebrity Astra. And that particular character kind of goes into a whole world that I think could become its own spin-off series. I mean, that alone is a premise about a society because it's true in this world, in this world that I created of E-Junkie, um, that clones are basically prisoners can clone themselves and have their clone work in the real world to work off their prison time. Oh, so wow. that alone could be like a premise for its own storyline. And yeah. it is a journal storyline about how, you know, the backstory of one of the characters that's a side character in a junkie um, named Tumult. So um, so there, it's a rich world. There's a lot to it. Um, there's a lot of arcing characters. And I can see this for for many um, books to come. Awesome. Cool. Uh, Nicholas, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, yeah. Congratulations on all the success. Fingers it's crossed amazing. you get to go into that bigger universe because this is a wild start. Yeah. Congrats. Thank you so Appreciate awesome. it. Thanks, Nicholas. <laughs> Thanks for having me. All right. There we go. Once again, the book is called E Junkie. It is out right now from Scout yeah, Comics. Check it out. Old graphic novel, and it is wild. Get your Let's fix. Bring... <laughs> Get your fix. Let's bring in our final guest of the evening. He is the writer of The Man from Maybe, which is out now from Oni Press. Jordan Thomas, welcome to the hey, show. Hey, welcome. Hello. Thank you. Hey, for guys. How's it going? Hang it out. Uh, so good. Uh, this book is wild. I love it. Um, I I will fully admit I'm not as familiar with your work, work other than this. Definitely, I know what I'm getting into when I see a shaky cane book, so I know I'm going to get some crazy <laughs> visuals. But I love the story here as well that grafts so many different genres together to form this wholly original story. Um, this is a very similar question to what I asked the last guest, but I'm curious what the initial inspiration for this book is. Was it Clint Eastwood movies per the name? Was it <laughs> sci-fi? Was it something else? amalgamation where did it start um so the actual initial inspiration was shaky messaging me saying okay so there's a load of dinosaurs and then this thing's gonna fall from space and crash in the middle of them mm -hmm. then a nasa style space buggy's gonna drive out from some trees two astronauts are gonna get out to investigate but then they're gonna take off their helmets and they're gonna be dinosaurs as well what do you think <laughs> Uh, and so that was kind of shaky laying down what he wanted to draw at the beginning. Um, and also he had this man from maybe kind of cowboy design that he'd already done. So I kind of took both of those things for, a, um, that shaky had already come up with and kind of the story came really naturally, weirdly naturally out of those two things being combined where there's a lot of, um, there's some good, the bad, and the ugly in there. Some Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some Mad Max. But yeah, the story, once we kind of had those couple of little pieces, came together really fluidly. It was a really weirdly easy script to write. Well, it, if <laughs> well, it comes from... Oh, go ahead, Pete. I was just going to say, after that pitch, uh, how could it not? I mean, that is <laughs> such a cool premise and so and the reveal when they do take off their mask is such a like oh shit cool moment that uh i think uh, you know as a reader who reads a lot i was still like oh man that is so cool uh i i just i, I did it just uh come so naturally because it feels so natural this book it, it's very creative but feels very kind of natural 
Yeah, I think because although there's a lot of strange stuff going on around it, it's really a classic kind of throwback adventure story. So Ferry in those kind of 70s 80s adventure films and then the spaghetti westerns but yeah. and like a lot of those films like raiders from the lost ark were pulling from the serials of like the 20s and 30s anyway so i think once i knew that was the kind of story that i wanted to put on to the kind of couple of pieces that shaky had already given me and we had this thing that we needed an object what had fallen from space once we kind of had that like yeah i don't know it all kind of came together and yeah once um once i had the villain who's this kind of Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. Area 51 obsessed kind of Elon Musk meets Darth <laughs> Vader kind of character. And yeah, once we had those characters, it all kind of seemed pretty natural what we were going to do with them. Yeah, I mean, moving over to the villain a little bit, it's almost this James Bond, and maybe this is a little bit through Shaky Kane's art, but it almost feels like uh, I thought he was a marionette at first. Like mm -hmm. I thought he was like a Howdy Doody style puppet or something like that. Was that anything that you were playing into the character or is that just how it came out of the art? Because my brain's broken, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. So I really like the idea of having this character who was like a kind of a, a businessman kind of tech billionaire type guy, whether, whether money's relevant in the world that we're in, isn't kind of, it might not be that relevant anymore, but he's certainly very powerful and has a lot of control, but that he could just kind of stare people out because he's always wearing this, like you say, a kind of marionette kind of a almost, um, there's a guy called, I, I don't know if it made it to America, but we used to have a singer called Frank Sidebottom in England. They made a film with Michael Fashbender uh kind of about him but he was this singer who would just wear a giant head like that and although he sang quite kind of silly like funny songs they're always kind of terrifying because his mm. he's just got this completely still giant puppet like head on him and i just imagine being in like business meetings because because i come from before being able to do comics full time i was in a corporate writing background doing a lot of copywriting for mm for big kind of conglomerates. And uh, so I've been in a lot of these business meetings where you're with someone who who knows what they want and you're maybe not giving it to them and they just kind of don't say anything and they're hoping that the silence will kind of push you <laughs> to come over to their side. And so this is kind of the ultimate version of that. This guy who always has to get what he wants, who can mm. just kind of sit there completely unmoving with the kind of ultimate poker face to freak people out. It's interesting to hear you say Our that move. because it sounds like, granted, we've only been talking for about five minutes here. That's how long I've known you. But it almost feels like this book is bringing together those two sides of your life in a way, right? Because you have the villain is your old life and the new life is this wild creativity <laughs> that you're finding with Shaky Kane where he calls you up, the, I'm going to assume, at two o'clock in the morning and says, dinosaurs, they're spacemen and they take their mask off. And you're like, got it. Let's go. Um is is that part of the creative process for you all in the book taking those amalgamating those parts of your life i think it's natural i guess that when you're writing you kind of pull a lot of things from different mm -hmm. parts of your life and as i i did do about kind of 10 years in the dealing with you know your vodafones and american expresses and people <laughs> like this and um i don't know if i should name names or not but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah all, all all very nice people i'm sure but uh, yeah, so that's going to kind of bleed in a bit, like dealing with all the like middle managers who are all terrified of making a decision in case they get in trouble from their superiors. So you end up like having to rework things and, you know, they, they often have a we'll know it when we see it kind of attitude. So you just have to keep doing stuff until you've magically managed to pick out of their head what they weren't able to articulate. It's a lot of the time kind of spent working on this stuff. So, yeah, I think some of the, probably the frustration of dealing with that kind of world seeps into to a lot of the stuff that I write. Yeah, sounds like it. Um, how is it, uh, you know, hopefully a company that you do like working with, it seems like, uh, how is it like working with Oni Press right now? I'm curious mostly because we sat down with Hunter Gorenson, who I've known for a while at Baltimore Comic-Con. He has these big plans that we're starting to see come to fruition end of this year, beginning of next year in terms of Oni Press. Um, so what, what works for you about that publisher in particular? Uh, so yeah, Oni have been great. And I guess a lot of it's come from Hunter, especially at the beginning is kind of when he got brought in to kind of, I guess it 
it looked like they were on slightly unsteady ground for a bit uh, last year. And then Hunter kind of came in and he, I think within about two weeks of being put in there, he got in touch with me because he'd actually backed mine and Shaky's weird work on Kickstarter mm -hmm, a few nice. years before. So I'd been in contact with him for a while and he was at Boom, but he wasn't really in a kind of editorial role at Boom where he could commission anything. But yeah, as soon as he came in at Oni, um, he got in touch and basically was like, I'd like to do a book with you and Shaky and have it be kind of part of our kind of first set of new series that are going to come out in the following awesome. year. And apart from really giving us like a page count, um, they, they weren't really, they didn't really get to, not that they weren't involved, but they kind of let us just go with what we wanted to do. Like oh, they said, Christ. we want, we look, we love weird work and we'd really love you guys to bring that kind of energy to a series here. So I mean, I still had to kind of send over briefs and things, but there was really no pushback on on pretty much anything. I think um, in one issue, I did kill a couple of kids, and they asked that I did that <laughs> off panel, and that was just, that was pretty much the. the and main, you said um, no, changed. and they were like, "Yeah, no, and I quit." <laughs> so, yeah, the third issue won't come out because I stormed <laughs> off. But, um, uh, well, that's great to hear. Uh, that's awesome, actually. I, I love that. Uh, what? So you have two of the three issues are out so far. Is that correct? So what do yeah, yeah. people expect potentially in the finale? Um, so I get, I guess a bit like in a good, the bad and the ugly kind of way and a, a little bit Raiders of the Lost Ark, we set all the different characters on a collision course, basically. So okay. they're all being kind of sucked towards the same space. So, um, whereas we've got these different villains, uh, a possessed kind of evil giant dinosaur, um, a tech enhanced bounty hunter, the Darth Vader, Elon Musk, and then our heroes. And they haven't really come into contact with each other, particularly in the first two issues, but that's all going to change in the final issue when there's kind nice. of a great big action piece of everyone being, being pulled together. Oh, awesome. Sounds fantastic. Uh, Jordan, this book is absolutely wild. I yeah, loved congrats. reading it. Uh, congratulations on it. And I, I can't wait to read the final issue before we let you go. Is there anything else you want to plug? Is there anything else coming out after this or other things people should check out? Uh, well, first, thanks for, for the kind words. That's great okay. that people are enjoying the books. I know it's a little bit different than um, a lot of stuff that comes out. So it's nice when people oh, buy yeah. into it. Uh, well, me and Shaky, we had um, weird work come out from Image over mm -hmm. the last kind of four months or so. So the trade collection of that will be in shops, I think, 7th of February. So people can pre-order mm -hmm. that now. So if you like Man From Maybe, I'm pretty sure that you'll like weird work because it's a different kind of genre, but it's very much cut from the same cloth. Uh, and apart from that, I do have a couple of cool things coming up, but they haven't quite been announced yet. I actually signed a contract today for a new series, and I have another one that's currently in the works that the the artist is on to the, the third issue of. But yeah, I don't think those are going to be announced quite yet. So maybe when um, when those are coming out, I can come back on and chat to you guys about yeah, those. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, this book is great. You're 100% welcome back, Jordan. Thank you so much for coming on. Have a great night. Great. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you. All Cheers. right. Bye. All right. There we go. Once again, the book is called The Man from Maybe. The first two yeah. issues, as we mentioned, are out now from Oni Press. They're wild. They're weird. They're awesome. Um, they're great. Definitely check them out. Yeah. And folks, we're going to move with our next section, which is my favorite section because you all make it up. It is your audience question. <laughs> on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch, not X slash Twitter, because that platform is an anti Semitic hellhole. Uh, what <laughs> are you drinking tonight? Now, I, I should mention. Brett Macris, a.k.a. Stray Bullet, a.k.a. Stray Bullies. Yeah, there you go. Uh, normally does a drink. He's been a little under the weather. So yeah, I hope in he's honor, feeling better. I hope he is feeling better. In honor of Thanksgiving, he wanted us to have drinks we were thankful for. Pete, are you thankful for your drink? What are you drinking? Yes, I am. I am drinking Labatt Blue. A little bit of a shout out to the uh, upstate New York, the Ra Cha Cha, where I'm from. And um, yeah, that's um, what makes me think of home. So I, uh, I uh, thankful for all my friends and family in the in the in the big rotch. The rotch. That's a horrible way of uh, calling it. But all right. <laughs> um, I made a Negroni. Usually, I prefer a Negroni with like Campari or something. I only had Aperol around, so 
frankly, it's a little sweeter than I like. Usually mm. I like it a little more bitter, but I'm thankful for Negronis. I like them. Yeah. That was a fake sip. I didn't actually sip it. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't you take an actual sip? I don't know, man. Uh, anyway, having a good time. Uh, oh, update for our listeners. Straight bullet says, I am feeling better. Yeah. Okay. All right. We did it. We, we did, did it. it. Our show healed him. Ah, awesome. This from Kevin. Kevin says, what are some ways you'd like to see some of your favorite characters reimagined? Hmm. Ooh. Hmm. Hmm. What do you think, Pete? Well, I don't know. It'd be nice if we could do kind of like a uh, Taylor's version of different characters and have the creators get paid more. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> instead of just like... Mm -hmm things making millions of dollars and then the people who created them don't see any of that money. So you would uh, like to reimagine some of your favorite characters in a fair world. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I and that, you. and then I'll go with my, you know, uh, classic go-tos where I would love to see concrete and a moody animated series somewhere or Ooh. something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, all the other stuff that uh, hasn't blown up yet that I love, like Mouse Guard or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you? I didn't even know this was happening, but oh my God, now I'm blanking on the director. But it was a guy who had his film killed. There was supposed to be a Mouse Guard film. Um, the guy who's directing Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes and he's directing something else coming up, wow. he apparently was working on a Mouse Guard film for a really long time. And there were some images he had made. It was supposed to be like CGI, a live action hybrid, I think. Hmm. Um, so awesome. I don't know. Yeah, that would be super fun. I don't really have a good answer to this one, I don't think, because most I things, took it. I took that said the greatest. Yeah. Yes. I'd love to see an updating of the Punisher as a guy with a similar name to Frank Castle, but not exactly. Oh, wow. Hey, guess what? We live in that world. We should it. There we go. What about uh, Detective Honey Bear getting its own series? How about that, buddy? Well, I don't Come know. On. That's. I think, to be fair, like I, I was to be fair. Like, I, to be fair, I think the reimagining that Kevin is talking about is like the Darkling. You take it from classic superhero style character give it a modern reimagining versus oh okay well in that case i would like to say cyclops not be a complete asshole you know mm. what i mean that would be my <laughs> these are all great answers Killing why don't we go over man. here this is from Frederico rosa what did you guys think about the new superman casting news there's been so much superman casting news we haven't talked about uh the big one today they announced that the there's gonna be a miss test mocker in Superman Miss Legacy, I don't remember the name Miss of the actress. And also, Skylar Glizondo, I think, has been cast as Jimmy Olsen. So Jimmy Olsen is going to be in the movie. Oh, wow. Great. That's good. Uh, the big one, though, is probably Nicholas Holt is going to be Lex Luthor after previously auditioning multiple times for Batman, auditioning multiple times for Superman. Finally got a role, and he's going to be Lex Luthor. What do you think about that, Pete? Can you help me out here? Who is Beast that? from X Men First Class? And wait, the uh, tall nerdy guy? Tall nerdy guy, yeah. Oh wow, interesting Lex. Yes, interesting Lex. Have you? I'm guessing not. Have you ever? Wait, seen wait. He was in that rom com where he played that zombie guy, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, spare, not spare parts. No, I know like what you're talking about. Warm bodies though. or something. Warm bodies. That's what it was. Yeah. Yes, he is. He can really play menacing very well. I don't know yep. if you ever he's, seen. He's a good actor. The Great on Hulu, where he plays Nicholas Tsar of Russia opposite Elle Fanning, and he is awesome on that show because one second he's hilarious, the next second he's absolutely. Um, I Perfectly terrifying. You think I don't know his range? I mean, I just told you about the rom com he was unbelievable in. I mean, come on. Zombie, he was not a zombie. What a range. But he he knew the role. I don't know why I'm blanking on saying so. Anyway, yeah, I think it's gonna be great. He's not necessarily what I think of. I but think that could be really interesting though. Yeah, I think people initially were like, he's gonna be like Jesse Eisenberg and playing <laughs> it as a tech nerd. I don't think so at all. I think he's gonna be awesome. I don't acknowledge that. Don't acknowledge anything. <laughs> no, don't acknowledge uh, that role because that, I uh, just makes me mad thinking about that casting and that whole thing. 
Frederico Rosa again says, did you guys see and did you guys see the new Godzilla TV show? Pete, have you watched you about Monarch Legacy of Monsters? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was literally watching it the first episode up until we started taping. Ooh, what uh, do you think so far? Oh man, that uh, it's uh, it's I, it's great. There's a lot of great stuff in it. Uh, there's way too much human bullshit, um, but it's interesting. It's I would recommend if that's what you're feeling, get through the first episode. Not because it becomes wall to wall monsters, but because you start to get into the human drama in a way that I never have in any other Godzilla thing. Like I think I don't want to get into human drama. I want to enjoy Godzilla. I'm well, here, here for I'm here for the you, monster. Right I'm before the show, the I was bullshit. watching Godzilla King of the Monsters, which I had never seen before. And I'll tell you what, that movie is stupid. But what? go fuck yourself. The but stupid, but great. Like that's what you want out of it, right? Yeah, where in the first minute Godzilla shows up, and then they very briefly have some stuff with Millie Bobby Brown and Vera Farmiga. Kyle Chandler, bless his heart, acting acting his little soul out and being like, "I'm a tough guy." I don't remember any of the humans. Are you are you thinking of Godzilla, the one with Aaron Taylor Johnson and Elizabeth Olsen, or are you thinking Godzilla: King of the Monsters, where he fights Mothra and? other yeah the, dragon King, guy yes yeah yeah i got up to the point when three-headed dragon guy comes out and i was like this is great i'm, I'm loving this <laughs> good time yeah uh so don't worry uh there is i will without spoiling anything there is a big monster attack every single episode i will say two other things about that show one i know we've mentioned this before but one of the co-showrunners is matt fraction so that's pretty cool on the comic book club bend but also marika tamaki was one of the staff writers on it as well and she writes i think the second to last episode of the season which is pretty good episode nice season ends real weird (laughs) thank Uh, you for the heads up no problem i just want to warn everybody out there without getting into spoilers it ended and i was like huh (laughs) so. <laughs> your face <laughs> wow that was off I, man i hope i don't make that face <laughs> what is Pretty weird what are the weirder endings i've seen in a while <laughs> oh my god uh I'm this is from stray bullet is there a favorite character you'd like to see get the archie treatment Ooh. Mm. character presumably from another publisher who would cross over a la the punisher I mean, on the same bed, I think Wolverine would be a fun character to throw in there. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, definitely. I think he'd probably try to, like, mentor. I was going to say hook up with, but mentor Betty because she's in high school, right? Like, he'd be like, let's solve some mysteries together or something like that. Let's hope so. Yeah. Yeah, Stab some stuff in the woods. (laughs) Let's get out some rage. Let's share some rage. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yes. Uh, and we got one left. Do you have an answer there other than my Wolverine answer? Well, you kind of took my answer. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things I would like to see. Um, you know, uh, you know, depending on what he means by the Archie treatment, like dusted off and really brought into a whole new light. I mean, where Archie was and what it's doing now is really impressive. Uh, Easy Reader says, "Give Moon Knight the Archie treatment." There we go. Love to see that. Hey, listen, we always talk about like the classic Archie triangle. They could do that except with Moon Knight. It'd be like, oh my God, which one of my personalities do I choose? Mm, yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, mm. I'm looking forward to talking about the latest Moon Knight with you. Speaking of which. We'll see what happens. And, uh, oh, we got one last tip here. This is from Kevin. For human drama, watch the later Gamera movies with the Boy Scouts meeting aliens. Thank you so much, Kevin. I'm definitely not going to do that, but I appreciate the recommendation for uh, anybody else. Kev, Kev's on it, man. Kev's on it. Uh, I got to tell you, I'm not like the biggest Godzilla guy in the world. I can't always get into those movies necessarily. Should have worn my t-shirt. Yeah. Your Godzilla t-shirt? Yeah. Yeah. I fucking love Godzilla, man. <laughs> I love that guy. So I'd marry does, him if I could. Uh, all he does is save the world time after time. You know what I mean? Yeah. You wish you could be a giant monster who gets to go to sleep under the ocean. Every oh, again. That's the best part. The dream. Yeah. What, what's the pay for something like that? You, that's the, the he doesn't do it for the money. 
He does it for the rest. That's the real love. <laughs> love of the art. You know? I love Godzilla being like, you know, guys, I, I don't do this for the money. I don't do this for the fame, for the glory. <laughs> do this for the fans. I do this uh, for you guys. I do it for the sleep, man. Yeah, this is it for the critics, this one. Says Godzilla on press tour. <laughs> All right, why don't we wrap this up here and move on to our next section, which is trivia. And for that, we're going to turn it over to Pete the Pie. Oh man, showed up to do trivia. You know what I mean? That would have been fun. Yeah, but this is a part we give back to you, the lovely audience. It's an opportunity to win 20 fr- 25 free dollars to Midtown Comics Online, because if you had some money, you go to the comic book shop. That's what I do. Um, so, yeah, all we need is a first-hand dub, or we can have uh, the Zelbatron uh, do it, and then we can donate the money somewhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't I don't know where we should donate the money. Every choice is very controversial these days. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Pol- politics. Political. Well, maybe we can give it to the Long John Silver Fund. You know what I mean? We can <laughs> yes. donate there. That's not kind of Yes, the meat-eating fish fund. The yeah. uh, We should give it to the, oh, my God, I spent so much money on stuff for Thanksgiving already fund. Oh, oh wow. Oh, man. I Oof. tell you. Man, there are so many mushrooms in my fridge right now, I can't even begin to tell you. That sounds delicious. Yeah. I'm going to make... Uh, I'm going to make a bunch of stuff, but I'm very excited to make a mushroom Wellington is one of the things that I'm going to do. Uh, we have some vegetarian, vegan style people coming over. So it's, uh, yeah. It's times like this, I wish uh, we had stray bullies to talk about, you know, Wellington. You know, I'm sure he's got the, yeah. a lot of Wellington things uh, to say. Rest in peace, right? No, don't what? He's <laughs> he feeling was better. He, he was he feeling, was, it's he's her, feeling it's her better, turn. you it's fucking turn. asshole. Don't you all right, man. What do you want? Well, to do? I'll tell you what. In honor of his memory, there is <laughs> no oh, easy reader. Says me. Okay. All right. Thank you, easy reader, for saving us. <laughs> I was getting ugly fast. All right. Here we go. Here we go, easy reader. Here we go. Today's trivia is on comic book facts and a small nod to the legend. Richard Mole, R.I.P. Bull Shannon. Please listen to all three options before making your selection. Here we go, easy reader. Question number one. Darth Vader was inspired by which Marvel villain? Is it A, Dr. Doom, B, Mo Vember, or is it C, Mo Collins? Ooh, this is a tough one. Mm-hmm. Because Mo Collins is pretty famous for her power over the dark side. Right, right, right. Um, and Mo Vember. And Mo Vember. As a secret son and daughter, so like it could be either one of the. Oh, he oh, says, he says, he says, a, a. He oh, says a. a. All right, great job, great. great job. Here we go. I was really happy to hear where that was going. It's too bad. Here we go. Question <laughs> number two. Uh, Marvel trade trademarked what word in 1973? Is it a zombies, b nut huggers, or is it c Phil Hartman? Hmm. So, in a lot of the Squirrel Girl comics, she's always saying "nut huggers." Right. I know. Like that's her catchphrase. She's like, "Ah, oh, nut huggers." <laughs> yeah. She's always saying that. Squirrel Girl is fantastic. So yeah, she's great. And uh, oh, he says a. Hey. Oh, he says a. Hey. Oh, oh wow. Man. Okay. Uh, nice job. Nice didn't job. Didn't even get to my Phil Hartman thing. Ah, oh, it's too bad. Here we go. Uh, last one. <laughs> the comics code. Forbid Marvel from using blank. Is it A, werewolves in their comics, B, the promotion of planking, or is it C, Jane Plank? Oh, interesting. Uh, Jane Plank, of course, is uh, instrumental in the creation of uh, Marvel Comics, and planking is something that was definitely... Oh, A? Is it A? a? Yes, it's werewolves. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, man. Man. Um, all right, there oh, we go. Man. Congratulations, Easy Reader. Shoot us an email, and we are going to get you a 25 Kevin, Kevin almost, almost got me. I almost said that, Kevin, but oh, you haven't got me in a while, Kev. Yeah, wait, so what's the secret movie that uh, you're paying... This- the secret movie is, of course, the 1996 banger, Jingle All the Way. Mm, what a great movie. And so seasonal now that we're almost here at yeah. Thanksgiving. Thank you. 
Uh, wonderful. Um, all right. Before we wrap up here, as we all know, new comic books are great and we love them. Pete. We do love them. What are you looking forward to that's coming out this week? Oh my God. I'm so glad you asked. There's a bunch. There's uh, it's a fantastic stack. I can't wait to get into it with you. Uh, Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong number two. Mm -hmm. Speaking of all that, there sure, was, uh, earlier conversation. Yeah, yeah. Marvel Superhero Secret Wars Battle World number one. Wow. And okay. just when just when you think I'm only into long titles, Void Rivals number six and the sensational She Hulk number two. Ooh, all great choices. Thank I'm you. gonna throw out there. I was very excited to check out Batman Off World number one because that is yes. Jason Aaron's official debut at dc comics so that's very exciting and interesting hack slash back to school number two from zoe thoroughgood oh, love the hack slash love the zoe thoroughgood so very excited about that and one of my favorite new superhero universes the alternates number three this is from the world of minor threats it's comes from mm. pat oswald jordan bloom tim seeley um really just interesting superhero universe that really delves into the psychology of characters so very fascinated to check out that stuff as well. And folks, that is it for this week's show. Yeah. A of people we want to thank. We want to thank Nicholas Tana for coming on yeah. to talk about e-junkie that is out right now from Scout Comics. Mm -hmm. Also Sarah Cahoon for talking yes. about Archie Comics Darkling, so which cool. is out tomorrow. So check that out in comic book stores this week. Also, the man from maybe that wasn't our guest. Jordan Thomas was our guest. <laughs> for the man from Baby from OD Press. The first two issues are out now, and the third issue is coming out soon. Next week, we are going to have Sean Kittleson and Eric Zawadzki from Ooh. Heart Attack. They're going to be here. This is an image comics book that is being adapted, I believe, into a TV series. Wow. Um, possibly a movie. i got to look that up before next week. We'll find you out. Should. Chris Supino from Blitmap is also going to be here, so should be a fun show. Bunch of things for you guys to check out. You can check out Scott Pilgrim versus the podcast. Yeah. Our podcast about Scott Pilgrim. We're about halfway through the animated show. We'll mm -hmm. get to the rest of that over the next week or two or so. It's the holidays. Cut, cut, cut it's the holidays, man. Comic Book Club News, our daily news show coming out every day of the week. We'll see if there's one coming out Thanksgiving. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, Marvel Vision, our Marvel podcast. We just put up all of the episodes of Loki as well as our review of the Marvels. Surprisingly... Uh, a calm discussion about the Marvels. Podvincible, oh. our Invincible podcast coming out weekly, including this week, should be up, fingers crossed, um, to finish up the half season here. Patreon.com slash comic book club to support the show and all the shows we do. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Android, Spotify, or the app of your choice at Comic Book Live on Twitter slash X, Comic Book Club Live on Instagram, TikTok, Comic Book Club Live.com for this podcast and many more. Good night. Yeah.